Okay, this is David Zeller, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022. I'm delighted to be here with Professor Raymond John Lowe's. Raymond, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. I'm really delighted to be able to talk with you. Raymond, to start, would you please tell me your title and institutional affiliation? So I'm a professor uh, in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science at University of California, Berkeley. Uh, as it happens, I also have appointments. Um, I'm a professor in the astronomy department, and I have a faculty appointment in our Institute of International Studies. Uh, and in addition to that, I actually also have an appointment at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. So I seem to get around academically a little bit. Raymond, let's unpack all of that. First of all, the appointment in astronomy, to what extent is that about the fact that your interest in geophysics are not strictly terrestrial, that you have interest with other planets as well? Uh, absolutely, 100%. Um, I think my engagement in our astronomy department, quite frankly, was triggered by my involvement actually more in teaching than in research initially. Um, I developed a very uh, large course for um, mainly for non-scientists, as is often the case, astronomy classes are not uh, only designed for uh, science majors or science students. Uh, when I say science, of course, I mean natural sciences. Um, but um, then uh, one, a chair or a department uh, several years ago decided because of that teaching engagement, and I really created some courses that were jointly run by our two departments, that they wanted me more involved in the astronomy department. And as it happened, at about that time, um, the revolution was starting to happen in astronomy with the discovery of extrasolar system planets. So perhaps that played a role as well, but increasingly astronomy was embracing planetary science as part of the spectrum of, of astronomy rather than seeing it as either you do astronomy and astrophysics or you do uh, uh, planetary science and earth science, it was really more of a sense of unification. And I certainly um, uh, appreciated that and, and welcomed and supported that kind of um, uh, uh, bridging between the departments. I'm not the only one, uh, by the way, um, with, with those kinds of joint appointments around here and colleagues from astronomy, has, just, some of them have entered into my department, EPS, and, and vice versa. So I think that's maybe one of the features we have on the Berkeley campus. Raymond, just to get a sense chronologically, what was your point of entree into the world of international affairs and, and nuclear security issues? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the, the, the honest answer is one thing led to another. It was incremental. Um, already in um, the 1980s, so I've been here in Berkeley since uh, 1982, and already in the mid to late 1980s, I was getting quite involved in the overlap between science and policy, starting with, uh, for example, um, science education. I was quite interested in uh, how we could improve science education and improve the impact of what we do in the sciences uh, upon the broader public. That was not very widely, um, that was not a, a very big focus at that time compared to what it is now. Of course, you know, there were superstars like Carl Sagan who were really promoting this idea. But anyway, I, I was quite, um, quite enthusiastic about reaching out to the public, first through science and education, through other aspects of policy. I got involved in what now in hindsight are called decadal studies. I was involved in one of the first ones that was done for the earth sciences um, back in the 1980s. And uh, with that, I became involved with uh, the, the National Academies, the National Research Council, some of their committees, um, the Board on Earth Sciences. Increasingly, that got me into the world of um, national and international security as one of the applications of the sciences in general, but even of geophysics. And as I think you know, um, one of the roles, one of the special roles that seismology has played is in monitoring for uh, nuclear explosions around the world. And nowadays, actually, we find that seismology provides a monitoring of many, many uh, human activities, as well as many, I call them non earthquake, non-seismological um, uh, phenomena around the world, which is a wonderful blossoming for that field. 
scientifically, but also in terms of its social impact. So that drew me in. And by the mid 90s, 1990s, I was um, spending much more time than uh, getting engaged in, in the interface between science and the security areas. Um, and have been doing that for you know about 30 years now, uh, more consciously focused on security, advising the government, basically the U.S. government primarily. Raymond Berkeley is such a big place. You have so many affiliations there. What role does the Hoover Institution play for you, your responsibilities, your interests that you can't get more locally on the Berkeley campus? So Hoover is a kind of a special place. I got drawn into the Hoover um, Institute. I, I'd say for one very important reason, one, one reason that has been a theme throughout my career, including in my later career, which is I had mentors. I had people who were really reaching out to me and helping me um, uh, enter into new areas or explore different topics, or I was advising them, or, or basically they were prompting me. So I, I have not shy to have a senior professor, a senior leader tell me, um, you know, here's something you should really look at, or I'd like to know the answer to that. And the specific people who uh, drew me into the Hoover Institute were um, uh, Sidney Drill, uh, long-standing uh, physics colleague at Stanford, and and uh, through him, George Shultz, the former Secretary of State, um, and I became quite involved in their projects, including uh, the so-called Gang of Four uh, project in the early 2000s, to try to think about the what, what it would take to have a world free of nuclear weapons. And uh, I'm happy to elaborate on that, but I just want to say before uh, setting that aside, that was a very uh, thoughtful effort led by very experienced people, Schultz, Kissinger, uh, Bill Perry, former Secretary of Defense, and Sam Nunn, former Senator, and very knowledgeable, um, very thoughtful about um, not just being uh, Pollyannish, but really thinking about what it would take to contain and control this incredibly powerful technology that is the nuclear technologies. Uh, so my ongoing role there, uh, of course, Sid Drow passed away a few years, several years ago, and more recently, George Schultz. There are ongoing colleagues. I had established some working relationships with a number of individuals, and um, they find my participation to still be interesting to them. And from my point of view, I learn a lot from interacting with the people. Um, most of the Hoover Institute is not uh, technically oriented. Um, so we're talking about political scientists, economists, um, people with uh, policy expertise. Um, and I find, uh, oh, and also senior retired military officers, I find I learn a lot from those very different communities. So I welcome that opportunity. And as long as they're willing to invite me to participate in their activities, I'm, I'm very happy to contribute. And I get a lot out of it. Raymond, of course, the optimism around ridding the world of nuclear weapons Perhaps it reached its crescendo during the Obama administration. Nowadays, with the crisis in Ukraine, concerns over chi Chinese uh, uh, designs on Taiwan, speaking for yourself, but also getting a sense from the peers that you work with on these issues, is that more of a pipe dream these days, or would you say the optimism is still warranted? I'd say... Um... I'd say the optimism is as warranted as, as ever. The actual process has historically been cyclic. We go through periods of crisis. Um, of course, during the Cold War, there would be the Cuban Missile Crisis stands out as, as, as an important one. But there were other crises as well. Um, there are also crises in confidence. There are uh, times where one one or another nation decides it has to pull back and rearm itself or advance its uh, armaments. But um, these are cyclic processes, and so for me, the underlying optimism is we still have to keep on talking with each other. These are enormously powerful technologies. I mean, they're just in a, I almost say like in a different universe of technologies. As technical people, it means something when I say, you know, the, the power uh, yeah, that that uh, nuclear technologies, nuclear explosive technologies have, is you know the order of a million fold or ten million fold that of conventional chemical processes, chemical explosives. We need as scientific, technical, engineering people to understand what that implies. Um, what the consequences uh, could or would be, and therefore how we might uh, mitigate and control those consequences, including 
the social and political consequences that might lead to the terrible use of some of these technologies. Uh, you know, you could ask the same questions about biotechnologies that are also potentially very, very powerful in their own way, not in the sense of physical destruction, but in other ways, and certainly uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the possible casualties from biological weapons are also horrific to contemplate. Uh, so we're not alone in, in this nuclear technology um, in, in acknowledging that we humans have gotten to a point of creating technologies that are very powerful. And the question is, are we um, emotionally, intellectually, socially strong enough to control those very technologies that we have created? Um, how can you not be optimistic? The, uh, the alternative is really uh, right. not something to be contemplated. <laughs> Raven, turning to your main area of expertise, in geophysics, what have been some of the commonalities of all the things that you've pursued in your career? What aspect of geophysics has sort of been central to your research agenda? That's a great, great question. Um, mostly, I'm interested in the properties of materials, planetary materials to be sure. But planetary materials, you know, rocks and ices and things are complicated things. So we often have to first understand more simple versions of materials, simple salts and metals and ceramics and oxides. And then the emphasis has been on understanding these material properties at very high pressures and temperatures, the conditions that exist deep inside planets, where one of the themes has been um, we want to understand the properties that control um, how planets evolve, well, what makes up planets, how they evolve, how they change over time, based on understanding what's happening deep inside them, which in many instances, the chemical and physical properties are quite different from those at ambient conditions. So there's, of course, huge disciplines of chemistry and material science and condensed matter physics and so on that tend to document materials at um, human ambient conditions. And we're passionate about trying to understand how those properties might change systematically as one goes to the more extreme conditions existing deep inside terrestrial Earth-like planets, giant planets, and even nowadays we're interested in the transition between planets and stars, so substellar objects, brown dwarfs, things like that. In what ways has your research agenda treated our knowledge of Earth and other planets as a two-way street? In other words, what we now understand about Earth we can extrapolate to other planets and vice versa. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, necessarily, we know so much more about the Earth that we apply that knowledge and that insight to um, other planets, in particular the so-called terrestrial or rocky planets. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, that can be also a flawed logic. And here, the best term I know of is actually one from the policy and security world, which is the phrase mirror imaging. In other words, you imagine that some other nation or society or perhaps even an adversary thinks the way you do. And so it's a crude analogy, but we have to be very careful in thinking about other planets as being similar to the Earth rather than appreciating that planets can be very different. And of course, the comeuppance for much of the community came with the discovery of extrasolar planets and realizing that our solar system is not typical as far as we can tell now. I mean, we all of the theories about planetary formation and where planets ought to be like and all that were, were very strongly um, based on, and I now have to say biased by, our knowledge of the solar system. And now we learn that most other planetary systems look really quite different. And we're trying, of course, as a broad community to parse that and to understand it. Um, much of that, I have to admit, has uh, is, is only indirectly related to my own research, you know, how planets actually form. Uh, our, where we come in is as a planet start accumulating the traumatic birthing of a planet, the violent processes, the impacts and all that, this is something that we actually start entering into and making measurements on materials, the kinds of very high density, high pressure plasmas that are created at high uh, temperatures as materials slam into each other and fundamentally um, offering much, maybe even most of the energy source that then drives the subsequent geological evolution or planetary evolution of planets. I mean, it's kind of an amazing thing to think that when we see volcanic eruptions and when we sense the earthquakes here on Earth, to some significant degree, we're looking at the consequences, the action, the geological activity 
that is still a consequence of that energy that was put into the planet four and a half billion years ago as it was accumulated. So we're quite passionate about trying to understand those processes, including in the case of the Earth, of course, the giant impact that led to the formation of the moon that basically splashed the moon out of the Earth. So uh, anyway, that's it's just to give you a flavor of the themes that we're interested in. We all learned in grade school that our sun is just a regular star. So wouldn't it follow that our solar system would not be particularly special? What are some of the things we're seeing observationally that tell us otherwise? So that's a great question. And we're really trying to parse what's typical, what's not typical, including um, recognizing that planetary systems change as a function of time. But of course, even from some of the earliest observations on extrasolar system, the observations of planets very close to their stars compared to what we see with Mercury, Venus, and Earth. We have nothing like planets that orbit our sun in a matter of a day or two or a few days. Um, so that's one difference. Also, another difference is uh, large planets um, like Jupiter, giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn that are quite close to their stars. Now, early on, people were very skittish about um, interpreting those observations because the nature of the observations tended to make it easier to um, to identify and to measure high rapidity, high periodicity um, orbits and also orbits of heavier planets around a star. With um, the improvement in technology, so it's been, I think, very conclusively shown that the sampling is not as biased as was at first feared. And um, as I'm sure you know from your Caltech colleagues who are among the premier observers in this area, it's just kind of amazing uh, the, the quite different configurations that we see in most extrasolar planetary systems with um, close-in large planets and very close-in planets orbiting at very high, uh, high periodicity. What is your sense, given the fact that Earth has a biosphere, which makes it unique as far as we can tell, what does that tell us about how unique Earth's interior is relative to other planets, or is the biosphere not considered to be a relevant factor here? That's a really good question. I have to say, on this one, I'm a bit of a skeptic and a cynic. Um, as far as I can tell, biospheres um, may exist in a wide variety of environments. Um, let me give you an example of something that's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. Um, astronomers and planetary scientists often uh, refer to the habitable zone as being that region which is uh, far away, far enough away from the star that liquid water could be present at the planetary surface without boiling away, and yet no, not so far away from the star that the water is frozen as solid ice. Why am I a little bit skeptical? You know, don't get me wrong. I, I use that concept, and it's based on trying to make sense of what observations are available. But the habitable zone is really a very pale reflection of the true range of conditions under which life not only can, but probably does initiate and evolve. So I'll give you an example. Even in the icy moons, um, and of course, I think you may know that such moons as uh, Europa or Enceladus, which are icy on the surface, harbor oceans underneath the uh, ice layer. And those are very plausible environments for life, and now subsurface life, but very plausible environments for, for something that we would label as life. And similarly, around volcanoes on an object, um, well, any of the, of, the, of the planets, but if you have volcanic activity that can locally provide enough warmth to, to uh, really stimulate life. And then actually, we see something like that here on Earth, where, of course, we have the black smokers um, in, in, in the ocean basins that show an incredibly rich set of ecosystems, um, rich in terms of diversity of organisms and diversity also, I'd say, genomically or evolutionarily. So I'm actually quite enthusiastic about the possibility of life existing under a much broader range of environmental conditions than we normally think of. In that sense, I kind of decouple the work that I do on the long-term interior evolution of a planet from whether or not it can harbor life. But surely um, the presence of atmosphere, possibly of oceans or icy uh, regions play, can play a very important role in determining a biosphere and how life originates. Um, and I'll just say my working hypothesis is that life originates quickly and often. It's a working <laughs> hypothesis. <great. laughs>
Raymond, a technical question. Absent our ability for direct observation of planetary interiors, you know, being able to drill down far greater depths than 10 kilometers or whatever the limit is right now, can you explain the observational methods that we use absent yeah. direct observation so that we yeah. have a degree of confidence that this is not just a simulation, that we're seeing the real deal? That's a great question. And uh, I would, or my community would challenge, what do you mean by direct observation? Because yes, uh, grabbing a sample and looking at it is uh, in some sense a direct observation, but so is probing the interior of a planet using acoustic seismic waves. Um, and in fact, you know, you, you, you can come up almost with, uh, with, with a conceptual uh, argument of what's the better way to do things. Now, you know, with our eyes, we have a very limited range of wavelengths with which we can look at things um, with seismology, at least for the Earth. There's a very broad range of frequencies or wavelengths, many orders of magnitude, many powers of 10, compared to the narrow window that we have for our eyeballs. And better than that, we can see two kinds of waves. You know, light is just transverse waves, like uh, co corresponding to shear waves in seismology, but seismology can also look at pressure waves. So there's actually a ver great richness of information that comes out of uh, seismology in terms of studying the Earth's interior and now the interior of Mars, and hopefully with time, other planetary interiors. We even have some hope for um, the possibility of observing the uh, elastic oscillation, seismic os oscillations of large planets by analogy with, with the beautiful work that's been done on uh, in so-called helioseismology on the oscillations of the sun. And there's hope in the community that at some point it'll be possible to also see the oscillations of the giant planets. So the, the, things are quite complicated. There are lots of winds and currents and things that need to be looked at. But anyway, that's actually a very exciting domain in terms of understanding the materials, but also the dynamics of the interiors. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the other uh, important process that is uh, characteristic of planetary interiors, which is the creation or sustainment of a magnetic field. And so the magnetic field for the Earth, the magnetic field for the planets in general, um, the internal magnetic field originates deep inside the planet um, in the stirring of uh, electrically conductive fluid for the Earth. It's the iron-rich uh, core of the Earth. In the case of uh, Jupiter and Saturn is the metallic form of hydrogen or hydrogen helium mixtures, uh, as is the case also for the sun. And this is where my area comes in, because we normally think of hydrogen as being a transparent gas, but at the conditions existing inside the giant planets, of course, it's no longer uh, a gas, it's a fluid. Um, and indeed, it's an electrically, con it's a fluid metal. It, think of it, it's more like mercury, a light form of mercury, um, uh, in that it's electrically conductive, it's shiny, it's reflective. And we're quite uh, enthusiastic about studying the properties of metallic hydrogen, because at some level, you know, it's, it's actually the most abundant material in our solar system, for example. It's what makes up the bulk of the interior of Jupiter and Saturn and the Sun, um, and is also present in other giant planets to varying degrees and may even be present inside the Earth as a as an alloying constituent. But anyway, we're very interested in the properties of, of metallic hydrogen for these um, astro planetary astronomical applications and also because of the fundamental physics and chemistry that's involved. Um, I'll leave it at that. Raymond, for all of your interests beyond Earth, of course, there's ground-based telescopes, there's, there's space-based telescopes, and there's spacecraft themselves. I wonder if you can provide an overview of how each of these different instruments is important for the questions you're after. Yeah, so um, the, the revolution in astronomy has happened in all three areas. It's really quite amazing. Ground-based telescopes now are still at the cutting edge state of the art, even though you might think, well, gee, they'll just be replaced by space-based telescopes that don't have to peer through the atmosphere. And yet with our ground-based telescopes, um, uh, brilliant minds keep on coming up with new tricks, new things that can be done. One area that I'm very enthusiastic about, uh, it's not my own direct research, but, but I'm, I, I keep an eye on it, is the monitoring, the use of ground-based telescopes to monitor how the sky changes with time. And I mean how specific astronomical or astrophysical um, objects are changing. So it's kind of time-dependent astronomy and trying to understand how well we can 
get snapshots of processes. Of course, one version of that is also the uh, discovery of extrasolar planets. So two decades ago, or two and a half decades ago, ground-based astronomy helped to revolutionize that. And even now, there are observations that can be made on the ground that are really um, too demanding to do in space. And the other way to look at it is you first try something very sophisticated and challenging on the ground, some new kind of spectrometer or detector, and once that's proven out, then maybe you take it to space. Of course, space, um, the Hubble telescope, I think appropriately drew enormous public attention only to be Oh, superseded, if I might say, by the scientific impact it's had. Now, the general public may not quite realize that uh, the scientific community is still reeling with the discoveries made uh, through the Hubble telescope. And it's not just pretty pictures that the public enjoy, but a terrific contribution. And then many of the other uh, space-based uh, observations, the Kepler mission, for example, and, and so on, and of course, now the James Webb Telescope. We're very, we're all super excited about these developments. Finally, um, the the rovers, the landers, um, the, uh, ob the the kinds of instrumentation that have been taken to asteroids, to cometary nuclei. This is absolutely phenomenal, and um, I hope to be able to see more samples actually return from these objects. Um, I will say, the cynic in me. This is maybe a good news story, but the cynic in me recognizes that very often when we've gone to other places and picked up samples, it's only to then recognize that, gee, we already had those samples, right? And so we went to the moon and then realized that actually some of the meteorites we had in our museum are actually lunar material. We've gone to Mars and we have not yet returned samples from Mars, but of course, our understanding is that we already have samples from Mars and we have samples from, uh, of course, meteorite samples from, from the asteroids, um, including some specific asteroids we think we can recognize. So that said, it's still hugely important for us to go out there, catch you know bits of comet dust, Stardust, as they say, but also the debris that's out there, including in these asteroidal objects, which are really the, the, the remnants, the, the fragments, the crumbs left over from the formation of our own planetary system. So by studying these, we can get a sense of the original materials that made up our planet. And then people like me can come along and say, yeah, but, for example, Earth's core may or may not be exactly like the kinds of natural analogs that we see in the metallic uh, you know, the iron alloy metals that we see in, in asteroids now. And we want to understand what are those differences that may have taken place over geological time as our own core has evolved. It's changed in temperature, possibly in chemical composition. It's unraveling itself um, and so on and so forth. So we're quite interested in those dynamics. Raymond, this has been a great tour of some of the big questions you've pursued over your career. Let's now do some personal history. We'll go back to Amherst College first. Now, were you interested in geophysics even as an undergraduate? That's a really good question, and the answer is uh, essentially no. I have to qualify that. So Amherst is where I got my degree, but it was actually the third college that I went to. Wow. Um, and in fact, I even took a, a, what would nowadays be called a, a, a gap period. I, I intended it to be a year. It turned out it was only about six six or seven months. But but I did take a gap. And, and I, I mentioned this because I'm a big fan of at some point, you know, um, uh, you, you, one rushes through middle school and high school and then off to college. And it served me, in my opinion, very well to have a little bit of a time period where I was starting to think, like, what do I really want to do? So to make a long story short, when I did come to go to Amherst, at that point, I had come to the conclusion that I was actually very interested in the sciences. And I happened to choose geology or earth sciences because I also loved the outdoors. I was doing a lot of mountaineering and hiking and that kind of thing. So it seemed like a natural way to get into the sciences. I'd had a little bit of science in high school, but quite frankly, I didn't have that much scientific training. Um, when I was at Amherst, I got a degree in, in geology. Um, and I will say the teachers there were terrific. Um, include, I got a fair amount of math and some background, but I'll just be blunt. I had a very poor science background um, compared to many of my peers getting degrees in the sciences. Um, and 
perhaps I'll just say it bluntly now, but that was one of the key reasons why I came to Caltech. I felt I needed, I wanted to shore up my technical background in the sciences. Um, and that was a, a rousing success for me. I, I can't speak for Caltech, but it was a terrific experience coming to Caltech and being immersed in what I still think of as kind of a monastery of science, but immersed in coursework, immersed in research. And I really um, learned an enormous amount. I had to beef up my physics, my chemistry, backgrounds in ways, you know, I was, I was surrounded by other graduate students who had been chemistry majors or physics majors or biology majors. That served me really well. I'm not sure they got as much out of me as I did out of that, but it was a terrific experience. Um, and, and in that sense, Amherst prepared me very well. Uh, when I say that my science training was meteoric, it was not their fault. Um, I'll just mention that I was primarily, in college, I was primarily interested in um, uh, comparative literature and music for, for, for much of my college career, a little bit of anthropology. Uh, it was only towards the end that I focused on science, and then graduate school was to, turn, to really get my science going. Raymond, it begs the question, intellectually and geographically, you were a long way off from Caltech as an undergraduate. So was it a professor? Did you do your own research? Were you aware of Caltech's reputation? How did the Seismolab get on your radar? So that's a great question. Um, it really was the reputation of Caltech and the Seismo Lab, the, 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 um, the department at Caltech, uh, really stood out as a premier research environment. And I knew that Caltech stood out as having the highest of standards for education. I like the small size. All of the schools I went to uh, in college were, were quite small. Um, actually, the very first college I went to was in Eastern California. Um, and I guess it may even be still the smallest or one of the smallest uh, accredited, uh, accredited colleges in the United States. But anyway, so, you know, I was coming back to California in that limited sense. And in fact, I've been introduced to, uh, uh, to some geology here in Eastern California when I was in my first two years of college. I came back to Caltech because really, quite frankly, the reputation in the sciences in general and then in earth sciences in particular at the Seismolab was just off scale excellent. Now, when you arrived, was it still in a moment of transition? When you first got to campus, was the Seismolab still up in the hills or had it already moved to campus? It had just moved to campus and I benefited from the fact that I, I mentioned, by the way, you know, I took a gap six months. And so I actually finished my bachelor's degree in December um, rather than in the normal June. And had I come to Caltech a bit earlier, I, I might have been caught up in that transition. As it happened, when I arrived, that transition was already complete, so I was very lucky that way. And second of all, probably I shouldn't admit this, but I'll just say it, I was very lucky because I didn't quite fit into the normal schedule of courses and so on. And I was able, in my opinion, to have a little bit more flexibility with the courses that I took and the activities that I undertook because I came in mid-year and I was kind of an odd oddball, at least for that reason, if not for others as well. Um, but that served me very well. And from my point of view, I, I suspect, you know, my, my, my mentors and professors may have found that I was um, a, kind of a pain in the neck from that point of view. But I, I'd like to think that that wasn't an issue or a problem. Raymond, how much of your time was specific to the Seismo Lab and how much of it was, as you mentioned, playing catch up in GPS more generally? That's a great question. I had a quite good geology training. Um, so from the geology point of view, I've done, for example, summer work, uh, working for the U.S. Geological Survey and to, uh, on an NSF-sponsored research project. So I had a bit of experience in doing field-related geology. Where I really need to be, needed the beefing up was in physics, chemistry, math. Um, and so some of that I did through courses, but quite frankly, a lot of that I really just did on my own. And at the time, um, so I, I, well, again, I hesitate to say this, but I had the view as an undergraduate student and also in high school that science, the teaching of science, the teaching of physical science in particular, was not very good in the United States. And I'm sorry to say, I'm not sure that my opinion is that much better these days. Yeah. Yeah, One yeah. of the reasons I've been very passionate about trying to contribute to science education, including, by the way, I, I felt at the time that it was kind of one of these go, no go decisions. You were either considered a serious science student uh, and then you have to put up with all sorts of crazy demands. You know, you're supposed to work super hard and it's okay that this homework set took you 20 hours to do. Nowadays, it's, 
you know, we're not trying to abuse science students. We're not trying to abuse students in general. In fact, in many cases, we're trying to entice students to learn a little bit about science without the idea of being that they have to become science majors or professionals. Otherwise, they're not worthy of the topic. It's quite the opposite. We'd like to inform citizens so that they have a better understanding, a better grip on the technology in which we're all immersed in our modern society. So it's a little bit of a rant. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, I'm speaking of gross overgeneralizations. I was very lucky to have fantastic professors, fantastic teachers at every level, high school, college, um, multiple colleges and at Caltech. So, but, but I was informed by the concern that, you know, more often, more often than not, you might take a class and after the first lecture or two realize, you know, this is just way more work than the reward. You know, I'm willing to work hard, but not if it's just gratuitous, you know, it's good for you to, 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 to suffer through the homeworks, that kind of thing. Having said that, um, you know, in a weird kind of way, it's only now I'm admitting, well, let me back off. One thing I realized at the time is that the most efficient way to learn something is to have a very good mentor, a senior person you can sit down with who really says, here's how it works. And that's the objective, I think, in good classes. The idea is for the professor to try and do that, communicate that to as many people as possible. It doesn't always work because people are at different levels or sometimes describing something one way works for one person, but absolutely doesn't work for another. I acknowledge that. And in fact, one of the features of some of the work that I've done in teaching is to try and provide alternative ways to see, you know, to come to a conclusion to understand something. And that's what was hard for me to find in the normal courses at the time. On the other hand, I found mentors. I found professors willing to sit down with me. And one of the benefits of Caltech, small, because it's small, is uh, I found it was possible to go knock on doors and just say, I don't understand this. Can you help explain it? And that was a huge benefit for me. In a weird kind of way, I'm now slowly realizing that I really benefited from the fact that I wasn't, you know, you could say not so, I wasn't all that successful in coursework. Uh, I got pretty good grades when I finished in college and all that, but I was not, it, it was a struggle and um, it was more self-taught material and going to mentors that became a huge theme for me throughout my career. And um, any successes I've had really comes from those individuals who have helped me and the, the, the fact that, you know, in a way I had to turn to alternative mechanisms than, than, than the courses that normally we professors think of are the best way to communicate with students. Raymond, given at Caltech initially there was so much for you to learn, so many professors to work with, what was the process of narrowing your interests, choosing a thesis advisor, choosing a dissertation topic? You know, these uh, it, uh, very often it's a combination of the subject itself being interesting. You something catches your attention, catches your eye. Uh, inevitably, also personal style plays a role. And um, I want to be careful how I say this, but I quickly identified a mentor and supporter. Uh, my thesis advisor, Tom Marins, where we found a mutual compatibility that really worked. He um, reached out and provided support right from the beginning when I was at Caltech. So he really identified me rather than the other way around. Um, I found him to be a very good person to work with. We had maybe similar working styles. I I, I was probably working like a fanatic, as I think he was at the time. Um, he was not very popular with students because he, he would be in his office on a Sunday morning or a Saturday afternoon or evening. And a lot of students felt, you know, I got a life. I got other things I wanted to do. And I was at a phase of my life. Maybe I'm still in it, but I was at a phase of my life where I was really committed to learning stuff. So if I wasn't in the lab or in my office actually working on something, doing an analysis or collecting data, more likely than not, I was at home reading through a textbook or something. And that kind of resonated. So I have to admit that working style played a role. And that's informed me as a professor and an advisor over the years. I'm very honest with graduate students who are getting started. I'm kind of going, you know, identify some people. It, it almost matters less what you're working on or what that research group is working on as compared to the working style. Do you resonate with that group? Do they support you? Do they provide an environment that you feel really good in working in? And I really had that. And uh, my advisor was not alone. I found I had several people I could turn to. In fact, I, for example, I remember 
the director of the lab, Don Anderson, I, was was a long-standing friend and colleague over the years because I viewed him also as another great mentor. I could go knock on his door and, and ask for his advice. Um, and these people, I realized later on, had also introduced me to the fact that they were busy doing things outside their research. They were busy in Washington, D.C. They were involved with a space program. They were involved in advising the government. And I'm sure that also had an influence on me uh, and uh, my interest in reaching out to, uh, to the policy side of uh, or the policy implications of science. Was JPL a resource for you at all during graduate school? Not directly. Uh, it could have been, but I was very involved with the uh, Shockwave Laboratory at, in the sub-basement of uh, South Mud, and that was a very unique facility. Um, it had just been stood up. It was a unique facility in academia. Uh, in fact, it's still the case of very few of these kinds of uh, shock, uh, shockwave facilities. So it's not that um, there was a deficiency at JPL. There was just such an overabundant richness on the campus. Um, and, and now, in the, at the time, the new Seismo Lab, that um, I didn't really have much time to go up there. I went there a few times, but uh, most of my activities were really at the level of understanding basic material properties. Um, you know, the comment I made earlier that we aspire to learn about complicated materials like minerals like feldspar or quartz or something like that. But to get there, we also have to start off with measuring, you know, the properties of uh, gold or platinum or silver or, or sodium chloride and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and so we were really in the throes of, of doing some basic experimental work at the time, trying to understand the role of impact on changing rocks as they get impacted on a planetary surface. So this was as the Apollo program was winding down and all those rocks had been brought back and essentially every one of those rocks has been subjected to massive um, impact or well, a whole range of impacts from large scale to, to micrometeorites. Um, and then we were also interested intrinsically in the properties of materials at high pressures and how that might apply to understanding the interiors of planets, the cores and deep mantles of planets. So there was kind of this dual use. One is planetary impact, and the other one was um, the planetary interiors. And that still remains a theme of interest. Raymond, intellectually, as you were getting ready to focus on your dissertation topic, what were some of the bigger questions in the field at that time? And how did you see your research developing to be responsive to some of those questions? Yeah, that's a great question. We were trying to understand some of the basic properties of the deep mantle of the earth, the core of the earth, the kinds of materials that are present there. So uh, already I was analyzing, um, I was collecting some data, but I was also analyzing other people's data to try and understand what are the properties of, for example, the Earth's core based on what, uh, what one could infer from the properties of iron at very high pressures and temperatures. Um, so I, I was happy to take other people's results and try and interpret them. In the case of my own experiments, I was also really interested in these impact, um, uh, I guess the term at the time was impact metamorphism, how rocks get changed upon impact. And so I did some studies to try and understand um, you, you might think of it as how to interpret the textures, the changes that one observes in rocks that have been subjected to impact. Impact on Earth, by the way, as much as uh, lunar rocks. Um, I, I, I might mention that at the time, this was the heyday of Gene Shoemaker, another professor in the division, uh, um, documenting how many um, craters are still observable on Earth, giant craters. Now, many of those deformed or eroded or transformed over time because of Earth's geological processes, but he was really uh, bringing home how much the Earth's surface still has a record of ancient impacts. And so in combination with the lunar uh, samples and the lunar program that documented the impacts on the moon, uh, I, was, I was quite intrigued in, in trying to see, for example, could we take a rock and say something about what's the size of the impact in the sense of what's the impact velocity or the magnitude of the impact? Can we say anything about that? It turns out we can say some things, but it's also uh, a lot of complications, a lot of modeling involved. I was right at the, this will get a tiny bit technical, but at that time I was also branching out into some new experimental techniques. So I mentioned the guns, the dynamic compression, basically shooting a bullet at a sample. Uh, that was one of the specialties at Caltech. But 
right, at the same time, there was another development in the field, which was the development of uh, so-called diamond anvil cells, basically squeezing on a tiny speck of sample material between the points of two diamonds. And that technology was just coming online. And as a graduate student, I was really fascinated by that. And so I went to, um, quite frankly, the leading experts in the field uh, in Washington, D.C., and spent some time learning those techniques and working with and collaborating and, and putting together a few uh, early studies while I was a graduate student. And I was very lucky that I had mentors and professors at Caltech that provided the intellectual support and the financial support that said, you go for it. You know, we can we, we can uh, uh, redirect our grant money to include, um, you know, these new technologies. And so I was very lucky to be able to start combining uh, the methods, uh, the, the kinds of measurements that can be obtained under impact. You not only compress materials, but you heat it up. Whereas when you squeeze the material between the tips of two diamonds, you simply squeeze it and you, you don't heat it unless you separately, like, put the diamonds in an oven or use a laser to heat the sample. So there was some technical differences that we could now use to combine the data from both types of experiments to say yet more about material properties. And that became a theme, um, uh, especially after I left Caltech. I've continued to use both of those technologies. Raymond, can you talk a little bit about the interplay of theory and observation for your thesis research? At the time, um, theory was very limited and uh, I'd say by comparison now uh, first principles theory quantum mechanics has become really a, a, an important working tool in the planetary and geophysical sciences just as it has in material science condensed matter physics and chemistry it's been a real revolution where for many years um, even uh, well you know let's say into the first decade or more of my career um, the theoreticians doing first principle calculations were still trying to develop their techniques, improve them, improve the approximations. It's quantum mechanics, but in practice, there are many approximations that have to be made in, in, in solving, uh, you know, for material properties. Um, nowadays, um, we, it's a, at the time, we were trying to provide experimental data that would help to uh, test theoretical calculations, improve those calculations, extend them. At some level, we're still doing that, but there's been a real change starting somewhere between 20 and 30 years ago. Um, people doing theory would come to us and say, I now predict that you'll f see the following if you do the experiment. Way at the time, in the 1980s, it was the other way around, and well into the 90s, you know, you do an experiment, make a measurement, and the theoreticians would come running after you and say, look, 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 I was able to reproduce your experimental measurement. I get the same answer, more or less. And we say, yeah, but that's not very useful. You know, I needed that before I did the experiment. Now it's the other way around. They come to us and they say, I can not only calculate the properties from many more materials than you can measure, I can calculate them at conditions that are really hard for you to get to. I can calculate properties that are really hard for you to measure. So it's the other way around. Theoreticians come to us, help us design experiments, help to interpret the measurements, do the measurements make sense, help us to extrapolate the measurements to properties that we may not be able to measure, and then also to extrapolate to conditions that we may not be able to get to. So there's been a huge, wonderful intermingling of the communities, and it's something, from my point of view, it's been a fantastic uh, development over the years. I've been part of that, I've benefited from that, and we've certainly supported to, um, having that blending between theory and experiment. In my group, we do a, a certain amount of theory uh, over the years, just enough to keep us in tune with the theoreticians, but otherwise we, we work with, with people who are doing full-time theory just as we work with people who do full-time uh, technical laboratory work, and we try and provide a bridge between the communities. Raven, you mentioned the importance of modeling during graduate school. It's going to sound like a long time ago, but what did the computers look like and how did you use them? You know, at the time, I did almost everything with a hand calculator. Um, I did very little. Yeah, I, I remember when the first megabyte of memory was brought in as a big <laughs> event. You know, that was a big deal. And, um, you know, quite frankly, it was a transition period where um, if I stayed on a little bit longer, what I was developing would have clearly gone over into being more computerized. I'll give you an example. We used to collect the records from these shock experiments on photographic film. And I think I was the first, or one of the first, at least at Caltech, 
to go over to the astronomy department where astronomy had already discovered when they have photographic plates, they want to digitize them because then you can analyze them with a computer. So I actually used a digitizer, you know, of, of, for photographic plates over in the astronomy department and digitized these records so that then they could be uh, processed numerically, digitally. That was a big breakthrough. And the actual analysis I did was pretty much by programmable calculator is what I would say at the time, I guess the precursor of laptop, uh, a little bit longer. And certainly once I left, everything, you know, now was becoming more automated. So rather than doing things by hand, now one would start processing the data using routines that quite frankly, now decades later, we're still in the community slow to develop community wide routines. You know, it's the usual thing. Every graduate student develops their own routine, but then making it a user-friendly community uh, program takes a, a, also a huge amount of effort and coordination across the community, and we're getting there. I mean, certainly we see this in many fields, um, seismology included, is also happening in, in high-pressure research. Um, but it's just to acknowledge that, you know, the first arriving the equations and showing that you can apply them to the data, that's a big effort. Doing the first studies is a big effort, but then making all of that really accessible to the community, that is also a lot of effort and, and requires community coordination, which uh, fortunately we've been blessed to have. Raymond, did your research involve any field work or was all data coming in remotely? That's a really good question. My own, uh, so I did, um, propositions, you know, I did some research in my first year and a half or so that included actually a field project in Southern California. Uh, but then I, I, I never went back into the field. It, ironically, I think I kind of discovered, even though I had entered into the sciences through earth sciences, because I like the outdoors, I think what I discovered, and I don't want to over uh, interpret this, you know, thinking back decades ago, but I think I discovered I really enjoy the outdoors, but I like it for fun, uh, less so for work. You know, if, you, if you're doing things like geological mapping or sampling, it's like you've got to go up to that peak or that ridge or down that valley because you've got to go see what's there or collect some samples. And, and that made me less enthusiastic than being able to hike to wherever I wanted to. So I've, and, and meanwhile, I think it was really mostly the fact that the lab work I found really fascinating. Uh, I had had a pretty strong background in thermodynamics, and I was learning about topics like geodynamics, the kind of fluid dynamics that, that determine the thermal evolution of planets. So I was just really thrilled to learn about these um, more theoretical and in, indoor types of uh, approaches and concepts. So I kind of got distracted from the field uh, from the field component uh, altogether. Raymond, when did you know you had enough to defend? For my thesis, you know, um, I was just publishing papers as a graduate student and as, okay, I actually, I do know the answer to that. Um, I was starting to give talks. Uh, I was giving talks at conferences, but I was also starting to give talks in, in departments and um, departments were starting to indicate an interest in whether, you know, might I be interested in, in uh, a faculty appointment. And, um, you know, it's, again, I, I, hindsight gets, gets distorted over time, so I don't want to read too much into this, but uh, I was very passionate about research, about the academic career. I, I was interested in teaching. Uh, I must say my recollection was that uh, teaching was not, you know, one of the great emphases for the faculty at Caltech. There were some great teachers, don't get me wrong, but, you know, it was, uh, it, it, it's not like in the modern time, I, probably also the case at Caltech, but certainly nowadays in any um, uh, high level university, everyone is expected to contribute to the educational mission, at least as much as to the scholarly research mission. Um, and, but I was quite passionate in the teaching end as well. And um, in fact, I, you know, even started doing some teaching when I was in high school and so on. But the short story um, was that uh, I was starting to get interest from, from various um, uh, universities and um, I got a, I, I can't quite remember, but I got a job offer or there was talk of a possible job offer if I finished my thesis. So I took a bunch of papers and I strung them together. Um, and I'd been very, very, very lucky to have such supportive faculty uh, around me who, who just cheered me on as far as I know. <laughs> you know. What they expressed to me was always just cheering me <laughs> on enthusiastically. Who was on your thesis committee? That's a good question. I hope I can remember all of them. Uh, I know Don Anderson was an advisor, a long-standing advisor. I know from my oral committee, 
so I think George Rossman was one of my advisors. I know he he also advised one of my propositions, uh, my, my oral proposals. And he was a big influence on me too. Uh, terrific. You know, the chemistry background, the spectroscopy background he had was something that was quite new to me. So I learned a lot from him. He had to bring me up to speed on things that I'm sure were incredibly um, uh, introductory. And, and he, he, was, he was actually a very effective uh, teacher and I uh, appreciate very much for working with him. So George Rossman, Don Anderson, Tom Ahrens was my main uh, advisor. Lee Silver was uh, the person who mentored the field work that, uh, that I did. Um, I know that I also got advice over the years from Jerry Wasserberg. My recollection was Jerry Wasserberg was a very busy guy, not only in the lab, but doing a lot of work in Washington and the like. So I'm, I'm not sure how much of an advisor he was officially, but I certainly got a lot out of talking with him. And ironically, then over the subsequent years, uh, Jerry, um, uh, after I left Caltech, he, he um, came out and I, I saw him in a number of academic environments where we had very good interactions. The same with Tom Ahrens and Don Anderson. So these were colleagues who I would run into and, and, and were very, very good mentors even beyond the PhD. After you graduated, what opportunities were available to you? What did you want to do next? Well, you know, I was in a place and at a time where um, I was able to go into a faculty position right away. And, uh, you know, when people kind of look at me funny, like, gee, how's that even possible? I say, well, you know, in a, in a way I was a, a, in a place and a time where it was a brand new field, mm -hmm. uh, what I was in, you know, it was kind of self-identifying as mineral physics or the physics and chemistry of minerals. So it was not like condensed matter. Well, at the time it was not even condensed matter physics. It was solid state right. physics <laughs> uh, and, and metallurgy and ceramics. These were kind of the fields of material science and physics. Uh, and so I'd say chemistry. And so working at the interface between those fields was very exciting. I had benefited enormously from talking with material scientists, including at Caltech. Um, I also had some collaborations at UCLA and elsewhere. Um, and, and really the, the difference of what we were doing with planetary materials was looking at really ugly, complicated materials, complicated crystal structures, but also there was always this tension in the community and we still have it. Do you try to work on the purest, best sample that you can get, or do you work on an actual dirty natural sample that might have all sorts of impurities and imperfections? And the answer is, of course, you have to kind of do both. Mm -hmm. You have to see what you can determine on the very pure, exquisite, high quality artificial samples that you could get to try and establish reproducible properties. But then you want to also make measurements on the natural versions, hopefully not too far removed, to see do any of those impurities and defects and minor elements and all that, do they make any difference? And sometimes they make a huge difference. And in some many cases, they don't make any difference. So it's really important for us to disentangle that. And it's been one of the themes in my career that in my lab, we're very proud to often work on very dirty samples where the rest of the community kind of holds their nose and says, oh, we would never touch those kinds of irreproducible samples. And they, I, I totally understand that. Too. We, we, we need all of the above. Um, anyways, just to say I was very lucky that I was able to um, get a faculty appointment right away. In fact, as a graduate student, when I knew that the, this, this prospect was coming together, it, it motivated me to wrap up my thesis, but also I seem to remember I wrote a, an NSF proposal I, um, while I was a graduate student and um, was able to submit it through my through my new uh, university department to to actually get some funding pretty quickly um, right when I started as a, as an assistant professor. So it was a very lucky time. And nowadays, when people ask me, you know, what should I do? I say, well, consider at least one possibility is to create a new field. <laughs> then, then you, you, you know, it's a, the crude analogy is like instead of trying to compete with all the other concert pianists out there, play some very, uh, you know, un unknown musical instrument and become the world's expert at that uh, unknown musical instrument. That was kind of the theme. <laughs> Raymond, this is as much an educational culture question as anything else, but when you joined the faculty at Harvard, were you made to understand or was it understood itself that? you know, prospects for promotion for assistant professors was really non-existent at that point? That's a really good question. My experience at Harvard was off-scale fantastic. It was absolutely wonderful. The answer to your question is no. I always felt very welcome. I had wonderful collaborations um, 
with people in chemistry, with people in material science, uh, the so-called, what's now the Division of Applied uh, Science at Harvard, but they had a materials research center. Um, and I um, participated in activities, uh, especially, so in chemistry, they had a group that doing um, first principles calculations with a absolutely uh, charismatic professor uh, who switched fields, but I still know him, Roy Gordon, a terrific colleague. Um, uh, and he had come in as an assistant professor and gotten tenure. Now, of course, um, I'll just say my opinion, he's he, he's a brilliant person. And so just because he managed to do it doesn't mean that I would manage to do it. But to be honest, I always felt extremely well supported, um, let's say intellectually by the department. Um, and I, it's not only I had no complaints, I, I thought it was a wonderful environment in which to work and to set up a lab and, and to and to thrive. Uh, it was a very traditional department, you know, very traditional university. So the flavor, the style, the culture was, of course, quite different from Caltech. Um, but I'd grown up in the Boston area. So, for example, I was familiar with the summers and the winters and so on. And, and I actually enjoyed very much uh, living close to the campus and being there. Um, and I, I, I have nothing but really positive uh, recollections um, uh, and, and I, I felt that way at the time, I'm quite sure. What aspects of your time at Harvard were an extrapolation, a continuation of what you were pursuing at Caltech? And what was brand new just by virtue of being in a yeah. new environment? So I consciously moved away from the kind of shockwave experiments mm -hmm. that Tom Aarons is on. That requires a very big laboratory, lots of funding. I, quite frankly, I kind of felt sorry for how hard you had to work to maintain the funding to just sustain that lab. Um, and I decided to go in a different direction, which was to uh, use this relatively newer technology of diamond anvil cells, very miniaturized. Uh, th actually, this also reflects on personal um, uh, style. Uh, even though I'd been in a lab where you know you have big bags of propellant and big samples and big diagnostics, I actually kind of like the miniaturized world of diamond anvil cells. A lot of technology was becoming miniaturized at the time. I saw a lot of detectors were making it possible to study samples in tiny specs. Uh, synchrotrons were becoming available for doing x-ray diffraction and spectroscopy. So a lot of technologies were becoming really available to emphasize small samples. And so I developed a small lab or a small scale lab for, for diamond anvil research at Harvard, consciously moving away from shock experiments but it's not that I abandoned the science. I was still interested in the science and either through collaboration or maintaining communication with Caltech or other labs that did this kind of thing, I, I maintained an interest. Ironically, I didn't know it at the time, um, but um, my very senior colleague at Harvard, Francis Birch, had been one of the pioneers in developing um, uh, shockwave experiments. Um, and I didn't fully understand or appreciate this because... Um, his effort in this area was uh, during the Manhattan Project during World War II. Mm -hmm. And he talked, um, I'd say not at all, <laughs> about his war years, about his war experience. So just to take a moment, he was, in many regards, he was considered kind of the father of geophysics or the greatest geophysicist in the US uh, for the 20th century, a, a fantastic individual very quiet, very reserved New Englander, from my point of view, a very nice person. Uh, he was always very, very nice to me. He had actually been a visiting professor at Caltech for maybe six months, something like that. So I'd known him a tiny bit as a graduate student, but didn't really get to know him. When I moved to Harvard, he had the office next door. I got to know him. He was very charming, very, again, my recollection was always incredibly friendly and supportive to me. He uh, gave me some problems to work on. Some of them, I'm still working on them. Um, very generous in that sense. But he did not tell me anything about his war years. He, he may, I think I was aware that he worked at Los Alamos in the Manhattan Project, but I knew nothing about what he had done. And so it was only later on that I realized that a lot of what I had worked on as a graduate student, for example, shockwave experiments, really came out of the Manhattan Project-related uh, research. And um, I, I, I say this because I'm just a little bit sorry that had I known more what questions to ask, he might have been more forthcoming. I have to say, though, I asked enough questions that I knew he was just not willing to talk 
about his experiences. Yeah. And I respected that. I was not going to press him on that. And of course, when he died, then a lot of this history became uh, available. Right. Partly, be I think it became declassified, basically. Raymond, tell me about the decision in 1982 to move to Berkeley. Yeah, that was basically what happened was I got a fantastic offer to move to the West Coast. And I mentioned I grew up in Boston, wonderful city. I lived in Cambridge. I could walk to work. It was absolutely wonderful. But even as a kid, I never liked hot and muggy summers. I can't stand the Washington, D.C., New York or Boston kinds of summers. And so when an opportunity came to move to Berkeley, um, the climate was really terrific and a wonderful uh, offer made in terms of startup funds and setting up a lab. Um, I saw opportunities for being able to collaborate in California with Caltech, it would be easier with the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory where they did shock experiments and I could then pursue that collaboration. Um, but to be quite honest, you know, uh, Harvard was uh, a great place. And then when this opportunity came up, um, you know, there was a little bit of negotiation, but uh, I felt uh, uh, there were real opportunities here. I'll also make another comment. It's I don't mean to be rude or anything, but the department here in Berkeley was, in my view, had historically been one of the top departments, but was not in good shape academically. Its reputation was, was, was in my view, plummeting. And um, when I was being interviewed and in the process of hiring, uh, I another colleague was being interviewed, um, uh, and we, we both compared notes, and we both kind of came to the same conclusion that, weirdly, there are great opportunities to go to some place that is not, or maybe no longer, the, the best in the world, if it's embedded in a broader institution, namely the university, that is very top quality. And um, that was kind of our, you know, conscious decision. It was a risk and it's paid off fantastically. The university here has been incredibly supportive of developments in this department. That colleague of mine is, is still here. He's just retired recently. And, and we felt we had a lot of opportunities for actually enhancing the impact of the department that we're in because we're embedded in a larger university that has terrific capabilities, high standards and all that. And so it was an opportunity actually to go to what was not considered the best department in the world anymore. Uh, you know, and of course, Caltech, I think, was widely considered the best or one of the very best. And so we aspire not so much to compete, but we all aspire to be um, you know, top caliber in both our education and scholarly work. Raymond, given that you saw your recruitment as part of a rebuilding of the department, did that influence your research at all, the kinds of questions you wanted to pursue when you joined the faculty? Yeah, I think I was very, at this point, I, I was becoming a little more strategic. I, you know, my, my first couple of years was set up a lab, get some measurements done so you can at least establish some credibility in your new environment. And I'd done enough of that. And I'd also done um, uh, some theoretical work, some modeling work. Uh, you know, inevitably, as an experimentalist, when you're setting up a lab, it can take a, a year as you're getting things going before they're up and running, maybe even more than a year sometimes. So I did a fair amount of modeling kind of analysis uh, of other people's data on some, uh, some other kinds of modeling. And so when I came here, I was a little more strategic in realizing that um, now I've got to really think on a, like a decade time scale. What am I going to work on? And I had some plans. Um, the main material that makes up the interior of our planet had been discovered. It's a mineral called Bridgmanite now. It's the perovskite structured uh, high pressure phase of one of the uh, minerals we see near the Earth's surface. And I was determined to you know, study its properties and document its stability to very high pressures and so on. Uh, I was not absolutely the first to work on this and I was not the discoverer of this phase. Um, but uh, I was determined to make to, to make sure that we made some key measurements on that. And we succeeded in doing that in the first five, six years that I was here. So I set up a lab and we got those kinds of measurements made, measurements also on iron. But um, measurements on iron allowed me to renew um, collaborations with Caltech. And so our measurements on, for example, the melting of iron were done very collaboratively with the shockwave lab at, at Caltech. And um, we 
put out some results that were very controversial at the time. They're less controversial now, but still it's an area of active study. And, uh, you know, we were off and running. So I do think I was a little bit more strategic. I felt I didn't need to perform with such an immediate kind of uh, uh, time scale for, for documenting um, results. I could think more on a decadal time scale, uh, and, and that was a great opportunity. Raymond, was there a specific space mission or technological advance that propelled you into space science, beyond Earth kinds of studies when you were at Berkeley? Um, I would say that I was really focused actually on terrestrial, on geophysics up until the Mm mid-90s. And it was really with the discovery of extrasolar planets that I became very excited about other uh, planetary applications. Also, by that time, i become a little bit more enthusiastic about studying um, hydrogen and hydrogen-helium mixtures. So I should mention that there was already a very active area of research, including with diamond anvil cells and with shockwaves, on hydrogen at high pressures. Uh, the search for met- the metallic state of uh, monatomic hydrogen, H metal, uh, has been going on for 80 plus years. Um, we're not even sure that we've managed to make it yet. Uh, there's some there's some indications that's been made, but it's still controversial, hasn't been reproduced. But long story short, I kind of stayed away from that area because it was a very competitive, um, specialized field. You need a lot of specialized technology, low temperature technology, and so on. And so I kind of stayed away from that. With time, um, I became more involved in that community uh, through shock experiments. I could collaborate. So I eased myself into that community looking at the materials making up the, the giant planets like hydrogen and helium. And so quite frankly, it was a combination of that uh, uh, technology becoming more available and applicable and the extrasolar planets now realizing, oh, we're really going to have a huge amount of new information about planets in general. And we need to know better about for a wide variety of compositions, um, you know, ices and gases and rocks and metals and so on, what, what the possible um, uh, permutations are for planetary interiors. Raymond, in the 1980s, while the Cold War was still happening, were you involved at all in nuclear weapons verification or things like that, or that came after? I was aware of it, but I was not involved directly. So I was aware, for example, that many of the graduate students in seismology at Caltech, but also here in Berkeley, were supported by um, uh, the Air Force, basically for research related to monitoring nuclear explosions. And actually, uh, that program generated phenomenal science, phenomenal capabilities, generated exquisite um, uh, modeling and simulation, quantitative modeling of um, the the uh, explosive movement, because an explosion is relatively simple source. It could be modeled very exquisitely. And then that same modeling now could be applied to earthquakes that are much more complicated, kind of rumbling and frictional stuttering and so on. So it was a terrific uh, development from that point of view, from the modeling and simulation, you call it theory point of view, terrific development of seismic networks around the world that were for monitoring purposes, but now being um, used also for earth structure and monitoring of earthquakes. Um, and so I, I um, observed that more on the sidelines, getting to know the seismologists, trying to interpret some of the broader data that applied, for example, the core and the mantle. Um, but I was not so directly involved. And it was really only, I'd say, in, by, in the mid-90s that I came more involved with the uh, nuclear weapons kind of technologies. Um, and here I should say, you know, I, I did benefit from the fact that, okay, by then I'd had... Um, 10 to 15 years worth of collaborations with people at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory or the Los Alamos National Laboratory. So I was aware they had their mission-oriented programmatic work uh, related to nuclear weapons. I was not at all involved in any of that, but I was aware that the same technologies that I was using, uh, gas guns for shock experiments, diamond anvil cells to study materials at higher pressures, somehow was relevant to the, te- the nuclear weapons technologies and that seismology was somehow involved with monitoring. And then I got drawn in more from the advisory side to learn more about these techniques and how then to advise policymakers about them. Raymond, a chicken and the egg question. When you were appointed professor of astronomy in 1998, 
How much of that was you were already doing work in that area and you got kind of pulled into the department? And how much of it was they saw what you were doing was really relevant to astronomy at that point? I think the biggest relevance for me, you know, um, I mean, the way they viewed me was more that I was contributing to their educational mission. It was through Mm -hmm. the teaching of big courses. And with time, um, my colleagues in astronomy, um, for for one thing, I, I, I have to be blunt, back in 1998, not just here in Berkeley, but still in most astronomy, astrophysics departments around the country, around the world, the planetary side was not very strongly emphasized. Usually, uh, there were, uh, um, like at, in GPS at, at Caltech, it's, planetary was associated more with earth science, with geology, than with astronomy, astrophysics. And I think that was more the norm. That has changed quite a bit. And um, that has changed to a large degree because students have been knocking on the door saying, I'm really interested in extrasolar planets. And so there's been a bridging between astronomy and geosciences that's i think been good for both sides and i think i happened to be in the right place at the right time i was teaching courses that were uh, oriented towards using planetary science to teach basic concepts of science and technology for non-scientists and i think my colleagues in astronomy uh, were supportive of that and here i have to give credit again to um carl sagan was a big positive influence in astronomy in the sciences in general but he really made it um he set a standard that i think still exists to the date in astronomy that putting effort into public communication and education broadly speaking is worthwhile it's valuable it's really important in all science and he he highlighted that in, in astronomy and so i think there was a receptiveness there quite frankly some of my best um, colleagues as teachers, some of the best teachers on this campus are also in the astronomy department. So, I, of course, I feel not only honored, but challenged to try and match or to try and emulate some of these superstar teachers. And um, I think it was more through that. With time, though, I have to say, I have had collaborations, research collaborations. There have been graduate students in that department, and those have involved some of my own um, uh, materials-oriented research, bringing material science, if you want, into the astronomical sciences. Um, and, and, and I've always felt very well welcomed by that community. Raven, if you can provide some historical perspective nowadays, as you well know, there's so much excitement in exoplanet research coming from a variety of disciplines. From that first discovery 25, 30 years ago, was your sense that everybody knew that this was the tip of the iceberg or were people concerned that it was really just a one-off and that there wouldn't be this rich, you know, 5,000 planets later kind of development that we've seen? I think there was hope that there would be many that would be discovered. I, I, I You know, hindsight is always what has to be careful about. It, but I think there was hope that there would be dozens or hundreds there was, I don't recall, you know, imagining it would be thousands or tens of thousands, which is where we're headed now. But, you know, so so there was some hope, but um, we, we were painfully aware that those first observations were very, very challenging, very difficult. Um, and really it was with perhaps the Kepler mission or, you know, certainly by the time of the Kepler mission, that completely changed the perspective of, you know, more or less every star has got a planet around it and that kind of thing. But um, the the original work uh, raised the hope, the possibility that many more planets and a diversity of planets would be observed. Especially, you may recall that the very first evidence for a planet was really for for uh, a planet orbiting a, a, a an exploded a dead star. And you know, so there's a, a lot of question of you know, would we see planetary systems? in the full bloom of the uh, the middle life or the early uh, life of a star, or would it only be, you know, um, after a system has evolved to its to its death or whatever. But that quickly got um, changed with, of course, the brilliant observations made with, you know, the various Doppler-based methods documenting that, no, indeed, that one, one can start really documenting that there are that there are many extrasolar systems and all of a sudden we went from you know that hope for a few dozen to t there, there are hundreds and then all of a sudden thousands that have been observed with all of the interest in both techno signatures and bio signatures do you see a specific geophysics area of expertise that will help contribute to that all-important question about the potential for life beyond earth 
Yeah, I think so. But I'm going to disappoint you because I'm going to disentangle two different things. I think the potential for life is extremely, uh, is, is, is very rich. Uh, the, the possibilities are high. As I said, my working hypothesis is that there's plenty of life out there. Um, it starts often, uh, it starts early and often, uh, you know, wherever it can. Um, it's a hypothesis and it, it's, it's in principle falsifiable. That's different from what many people really focus on when they say life, they think of quote unquote intelligent life or life that can communicate with us. That part is still, I'd say, very much in the realm of speculation of wh whether or not we, we would find uh, evidence of other, let's say, te technological uh, entities out there that could communicate with us. Um, now, my enthusiasm for life forms of being potentially present in a lot of places is just the recognition that um, we humans are just a very weird uh, end member of, uh, and I don't mean necessarily extreme like most advanced, we're just like the tip of the tip of a twig on a tiny branch on a bigger limb on, on the tree of life and the, the full richness of life that we even see here on earth. Um, most of that life um, you know, can reside under very unusual, or much of that, I should say, can reside under very unusual circumstances, could develop, could start and evolve under very uh, um, demanding uh, conditions and um, under a great variety of conditions. And so, you know, when you think of life as we know it, it's mostly microbial, it's <laughs> microorganisms, not big macroorganisms like plants and animals that we can see. And so from that point of view, I think there's a lot of potential for life being out there looked at from that point of view, then yes, we will have to be looking for biosignatures. These might be uh, spectroscopic uh, indicators for certain molecules and atmospheres that we might be able to convince ourselves one way or the other are more likely the result of uh, biological processes or life processes than of the um, inorganic processes that, that we might otherwise expect for that, for that planet. And that really comes down to some combination of um, geochemistry and geophysics, but also combined, of course, with astronomical observations, like I say, of, of, of uh, the spectra of atmospheres, the kind of data that's just now beginning to come to fruition experiment, uh, empirically. Raymond, because you've had a front row seat to the processes, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the role of the National Academy in formulating science policy in the United States. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, the Academy, uh, our National Academy is a rather unusual organization, and um, it's actually, first of all, as far as I can tell, it's widely misunderstood, including by most of its members. It's really, you know, got a role to play in um, helping to inform the nation, the America, the United States of America. Uh, it's um, it was stood up by Congress to advise the U.S. government. That's its role. That's its job. Um, ironically, it was stood up as an independent organization, not as part of the government, but independent. So you know, nowadays we talk about things like conflict of interests, thinking it's a very modern concept. But you know, this goes way back in our own history that in at the time of the Civil War, when the National Academy was stood up, there was already the understanding that if you want solid, reliable advice, the best way to do that is to bring in an entity that is independent, that doesn't have, you know, an axe to grind or uh, or some, you know, favorite uh, position that or w w any favoritism that's involved. Um, and by the way, uh, ironically, there's also a, a, another small implication: all the work that, in general. Um, we in the scientific community do for the academy or within the academy or on its behalf, we do as volunteers. We're labeled as volunteers. We're not paid for it. And that was already embedded. Again, when Congress stood up saying, no, we want people who are not getting paid. And so I, I make this point because as you look around the world, um, there are not that many organizations. Let me put it the other way around. There are not that many governments that benefit from having strong technical input that is also independent. Um, and I think this plays a very important role in our society um, and has great potential looking to the future. So in some cases, the academies are completely honorific and have nothing to do with advising their governments, have nothing to do with serving society or looking at the interface between science and society, except to the degree that they think it's interesting. Maybe the, those societies are more really to promote science and, and its appreciation. In other cases, there are advisory bodies around the world, but 
often uh, in other nations, quite frankly, um, the advisors are insiders. You know, who knows who? It's networked, and maybe they're even consultants. They're being paid for their advice. I, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. I'm just saying that the model we have, the business model we have in the United States, is is rather unusual, and I think actually serves us very, very well. It's not for me to say what other countries should do, but it does serve us very well. And I include in that not only advising on science and science policy, but in other important domains like education and science and technical education for the public, including for public that's not going to become scientists or technical people, but also in the security area, military advice, um, national defense and so on. And there are some countries where, for example, national defense and academia are very, there's a, there's a, there's a huge gap between them. They're pulled apart by social or cultural or historical um, tradition. And I think we benefit a lot in the United States by actually bringing in academics, you know, from the outside who have technical expertise, but also who ask questions, who will say, why are we doing this? Why are we doing it this way? Is this the right thing to be doing? Um, now, you know, policy, like science, it's a human activity. It's uh, not always perfect. And in fact, in many cases, quite imperfect. And so we grope around, trying to find the best solutions. Um, but we can address questions like, um, should we be collaborating with scientists in Russia mm -hmm. these days, given, you know, the war that from our understanding, and now I speak for myself, is a, is, is a war that was triggered, was created by the Russian Federation. It was not inflicted on the Russian Federation. Quite the contrary, they inflicted it on Ukraine. Should we have collaborations? What's the moral thing to do? What's the right thing to do from a policy point of view long term? Including, oh, by the way, you know, we would all like to think that at some point, there will be an opportunity for bringing peace, some peaceful resolution. Well, how do you have a peaceful resolution if you don't have any channels of communication? Yeah. You know, so there are issues like that. Uh, I should also note, by the way, that um, immediately on, what was it, the 24th of February, some of our most distinguished, long-standing colleagues in Russian scientific community stood up and very publicly said, this is wrong. Yeah. This is not us. This is not the right. So, you know, do we <clears throat> abandon those people, including, you know, quite frankly, um, those in the, uh, I'll call it intellectual community, those who can, can look to the outside, they know that they're facing potential of, what, 15 years of prison just for calling the war into question. What's the right, right way for us to reach out and be supportive without undermining them or put it, making them vulnerable on the one hand, without facilitating the technology being put to bad use by the Russian Federation? Not everyone in the scientific community in Russia has been against the war. In fact, quite, there have been some who have been vocally in support of the war that many of us consider to be absolutely wrong. And then meanwhile, what do we do to support our colleagues in Ukraine? Um, and the surrounding uh, European Union. Um, these are big questions. I, as an individual, don't have the answers, but I'm happy to contribute, if I can, um, to some of the discussions to how do we think about these things and how do we find the right balance so that we don't just chop off all possibility of communication on the one hand, but on the other hand, we're not inadvertently facilitating uh, an effort that many of us consider to be absolutely a, a wrong war that's been imposed on, on a neighboring, a smaller neighboring state. Raymond, tell me about the Miller Institute at Berkeley and some of the value for you when you had an affiliation there. Thank you. That's a great question. So the Miller Institute was stood up by actually an economist, not a scientist, um, uh, with with a, at the time, small endowment, a few million dollars back in the mid-1950s. And um, that money uh, was very explicitly uh, assigned to supporting basic research in science. And the argument of Professor Miller, who was a professor actually in what is now our business school, was that the applied areas of engineering and applied science, um, as well as uh, other applied areas, economics might be another example, uh, get plenty of support from the government and from industry and from society in general. But basic fundamental science, he felt, needed uh, support because that would provide, if you want, the feedstock for future innovation and for 
applied uh, technological developments that we would all benefit from. So he ruled out, and, and another applied science would be, for example, medical research. So he set aside this money. That endowment um, over the years grew into a fairly substantial amount of money that has allowed um, the, our university to support scholars from the outside, postdoctoral fellows, has supported uh, visiting professors from the outside and also given a little bit of support for um, faculty on the inside who, are, who, who basically are doing uh, basic research in science and put in a proposal that's then approved. Um, what I thought was wonderful about the Institute was it was cross-disciplinary right from the start. Every aspect of science was involved, basic science, so from astronomy and astrophysics to mathematics and zoology. Um, the institute is relatively small. Typically, there's maybe two dozen postdoctoral fellows. For uh, they get a three-year appointment, so you know maybe a dozen get appointed at a time, and then some stay for a second, some even for a third year. Um, there may be a, a dozen other members, so it's only a, you know three dozen people or so. And um, what to me was important and interesting was the ability to uh, talk across disciplines. Um, so uh, let me back off for a second. It's just a curiosity. I mentioned him earlier, but I believe the first person to be a Miller postdoctoral fellow was, in fact, Carl Sagan. Oh, and, wow. <laughs> uh, he was brought in. He was uh, alone, but, you know, it was the beginning. Um, uh, but years later, so when I became associated with the Institute, uh, I felt there was a little bit of a tendency. I want to be careful how I say this, but, you know, it's something that's very common in many departments, too have the attitude of, well, you know, the, the best way to, to, to deal with the endowment is to get, you know, the specialists in each area to identify the very best people in their specialty. Uh, you know, the best geologists to identify the best geologists, the best physicists to identify the best physicists. And we kind of turned that logic on its head. We said, no, we're really looking for, and I'm not alone, but I've got to speak for myself and take the blame for it. Um, we're really looking for people who are not only excellent at what they do, but can also communicate across the disciplines. And communication is a, you, you have to be willing to do it and you have to be able to do it. There's some people who want to do it, but they're not very good at it or don't have much to say. There's some people who um, are, 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 are very good at, at speaking, but you know they, they don't have much to offer. So you're looking for this magical combination of people who have really interesting accomplishments, but also can talk about them across the disciplines. And we felt this was very important, especially for the more senior members. So I mentioned there are Miller professors and visiting professors. So it's very important for that cadre to be in place to mentor the postdoctoral fellows who are just entering into the field. Um, ironically, my observation is over years, until uh, we've succeeded, and a mark of our success is actually we find that the Miller postdoctoral fellows, especially those who have been here for six months or a year, they really get it. They really understand how exquisitely important it is to be able to communicate to someone in a dis different discipline or maybe even someone who's not a scientist in 30 seconds, in three minutes, in a short period of time. Here's what I do. Here's why you care about it. And often it's now the visiting professors, very eminent people who come in, they're learning something for the first time. They're put on the spot of not, you know, oh, you're famous so-and-so, and, -so, and you know, so I'm going to listen to you. It's like, no, you tell me why I should be listening to you past the first 30 seconds. I, I, we're not adversarial like that. But through example, the Miller Losanto fellows have learned to communicate their material very effectively. And we've noticed some very senior people, you know, they, they pick up and they go, whoa, yeah, this has been very interesting. So we've been very proud of that development of consciously being cross-disciplinary. Um, you know, some people have compared and contrasted us with the Society of Fellows mm -hmm. at Harvard University. And I think actually the Society of Fellows has a very similar kind of business model, I might say. But there's a big difference. And here, um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure who's, who's better off or not, but we have the easier task. The Society of Fellows cuts across many disciplines. We're, the Miller Institute is really focused on science. And so there are benefits and drawbacks to both. We, we, you don't have the opportunity for a younger person to interact with the likes of a John Kenneth Galbraith or you know some very famous author or some very famous economist or what have you. Um, in that sense, we're narrower. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think, especially for a first step towards 
broadening one's education and also one's ability to communicate, we find it more, I'd say certainly easier, possibly more effective to have a focus on the sciences. It's hard enough getting you know, a, a biologist to be able to explain to an astrophysicist and to a statistical mechanic and physics what they're doing. Um, so we have a narrower domain, and we think that's already a big contribution. But don't get me wrong, these are great efforts on all sides, and I, I see them as kind of complementary in a sense. So I was very lucky to be associated with the Institute. We did start a program where once a year we get together for a couple of days and have cross-disciplinary discussions um, We've been doing this for more than 20 years, maybe approaching 25 years. And uh, for comparison, I was part of a similar effort to do have a cross-disciplinary conference um, in the United States set up by a different organization, which lasted three years. So I, I, I realized that um, it's very hard to make these things work. You have to have just the right... Um, uh, audience and interaction. It's a combination of social interaction as well as willingness to take a risk. You're literally asking people who are top notch in their field to be willing to ask a stupid question, to be, yeah. to realize that, you know, I, no matter what I ask, I'm not making a fool of myself. I'm just trying to learn about it. And I have to say, this is something I actually learned from my advisor. Um, tolerance was, was noted for asking questions about things he just didn't understand, no matter how introductory it was, or no matter how quote unquote a dumb question it was. And so very much, I think in my life, I felt like the important thing is to communicate. There's no such thing as a dumb question. You know, of course, we may be ignorant about some basic things, or some that we may have forgotten things you know, that we're trying to reconstruct. Maybe I'm asking a question about something I might have even discovered years ago. But the point is, it's okay to ask a question, and it's not a reflection on I don't care or I'm stupid. It's really just I'm interested is really what was reflected. Anyway, I've gone on long enough, but uh, the Miller Institute has been a wonderful environment in which to uh, develop that kind of theme. You're saying a mark of a truly great professor like Tom Aarons is that they don't let their ego get in the way. When they're ignorant about something, they're not afraid to show it. Just, just ask, just ask a dumb question. Ego is a very funny thing, though. You know, it, um, it's very easy for us to 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 think about ego as uh, well. You know, the ego that fills the room, or that, that you know, suffocates everyone around them, and all that. Um, and so, ego gets a lot of a of a bad rap or a bad message, and for reasons like what you're alluding to, keeps people from asking the questions that would actually educate them and help them contribute more. Uh, on the other hand, ego is also what drives people to try and do excellent things and to be excellent. And so, there's this funny balance between ego being the fuel or, or some of the fuel that powers much of innovation. It's because there's someone who's really willing. To, to work super hard and maybe try and become super rich or super famous or super impactful or super something. And so that's a form of ego, but you're absolutely right. Ego can also get in the way. Raymond, to bring our conversation up to the present, the last 10 years, specifically in light of your appointment at the Hoover Institute, just a time management question with all of your involvement in national policy and international affairs, how do you carve out the time for the science, to remain at the cutting edge of the field, to stay on top of the literature, to give your students the attention that they need? I have to admit, first of all, as a more senior scientist, I, I just have to admit I'm not keeping up. Uh, the literature is ballooning, exploding in richness. Um, and, and you know, sadly, what this means is for many students and, and younger colleagues, it means that they tend to narrow their domain because that's the only way they can keep up with their own area. So I'm recognizing times are changing. All I can, you know, recall for you is is the the or almost caricature for you is the uh, uh, Richard Feynman statement that he used to read the physical review from cover to cover whenever it came out, and now there just wouldn't even be the time in the day to available to 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 do even some small fraction of that. So um, part of the answer is actually. Um, the technology we're using right now, I um, can use video conferencing to talk with colleagues 
And um, I'll quote a colleague of mine. We were actually communicating. He was, a, he was in D.C. at the time, but he uh, also has an appointment in, in, uh, at the Hoover Institute. And I, I said, well, next time you're in the Bay Area, please come and visit. Uh, in, in reality, and he chuckled and he said, you know, the reality is that it's just so easy to have a video call that even across the Bay Area, which is maybe an hour's drive, well, with traffic, it might be an hour and a half or two hours drive, you know, why not just have a video conference. So that has revolutionized our ability to interact also scientifically across our research collaborations and teams and in the international discussions that we have. Uh, actually, in the international realm, it's really been revolutionary because um, uh, it's, it's made it possible to speak with people quite often for shorter periods of time, but you can kind of catch up and, and you know, have question and answer cycles that are that are much more rapid so that's been part of the answer but uh, also part of the answer is i'm not keeping up as well as i wish so to give a sense to bring our conversation right up to the present day circa august 2022 what are you working on currently both in the science and the policy realms so i've been uh, involved for uh, now more than two decades with a group within the academy that talks with um international security specialists or national defense specialists in other countries, specifically uh, long-standing dialogues with colleagues in the Russian Federation and China and in South Asia, um, but also many other uh, parallel efforts. So just to say that uh, right, uh, right now I'm part of a team, a just absolutely fantastic team of um, retired senior policymakers in the U.S., retired senior military officers, and then a number of senior scientists, um, most of us not retired, um, talking about uh, security, national and international security, arms control, and so on. In the case of the Russian Federation, um, our group used to meet with our Russian counterparts maybe every year or year and a half. Typically, we would go over there. They would come over here. So maybe once a year, we'd, we'd, we'd swap off uh, seeing each other. We now um, talk with each other every two weeks. Our Chinese colleagues, similarly, we see them every year and a half. It has been historically very difficult for the Chinese to come into the United States because of uh, certain visa restrictions on senior military and government officials. Um, so we would tend to go to China. And instead of seeing them every year and a half or two years, again, we see them every several weeks uh, remotely. I, of course, with COVID, we had to do that. And ironically, this is one of the uh, silver linings of COVID. Of course, COVID has been devastating around the world to health, public health and, and uh, mortality and also to economies. But one of the silver linings is it's gotten us very used to communicating remotely as I'm, I'm speaking now as human beings, but also in our in our intellectual endeavors and our professions. And so um, we've been able to have discussions with counterparts uh, to talk about um, the uh, developments in uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons policy and cybersecurity, the military use of um, both cyber intrusion, but also autonomous systems. What, what kind of weapons are there or could there be or should there be that are partly or fully automated? Uh, we can talk about space security because nowadays almost everything we do goes through space, including our cyber infrastructure, the Internet, and so on. So what happens in space now is no longer determined by just a few powerful nations like during the Cold War, where it was mostly the U.S. and the Soviet Union and uh, just a limited degree, a few other nations. Now space is uh, everyone, including the business community, right? So it's a very different kind of a domain. And of course, you know, war or terrorism, I should mention also, these are very uh, pressing topics. In some cases, uh, now I give you again my opinion, we learn a lot. Um, I'll give you an example, talking with our colleagues in India or um, Israel as an example, they sadly have a lot of experience, uh, I'd say a lot more experience per capita with terrorism than we do in the United States. We're, we're kind of blessed in many ways. And so we uh, learn when we talk to communities that have to deal with um, countering terror terrorism, mitigating the effects, um, uh, trying to avoid 
catastrophic terrorism. And of course, we're, we're talking also with our um, major um, counterparts, uh, Russia and China in particular, about how to avoid um, crisis and how to uh, reduce crisis. So our role, um, I, I, I don't want to go on, I mean, I, I can go on for a long time, but I don't want to bore you with anything. Our role is really to try and step in and create or maintain conversations, channels of communication, especially where our governments cannot do so. So right now, for example, the U.S. government has great difficulty in talking with the Russian Federation. We have sanctions against, for example, government-to-government collaboration in many areas of science and technology where there used to be collaborations up till a few months ago. That's now being terminated because of the concern that those collaborations are helping to sustain and support the Russian effort, the Russian war uh, effort in Ukraine, and that's not something we want to do. The counter to that, of course, as you I no doubt heard a few days ago, the Russian Federation saying that they will pull out of um, their collaboration with the International Space Station and possibly with all space collaboration. Uh, many of us feel that this is unfortunate because um, every channel of communication that gets broken increases the chances for miscommunication and misunderstanding between our countries. Um, we don't have to like each other necessarily, but uh, we, again, have uh, very powerful technologies in both of our countries and in other countries as well. And so we have to learn how to live with each other and how to uh, avoid crisis that would trigger the use of very powerful technologies. And so crisis prevention, um, strategic stability, these kinds of things are very much at the heart of what we're trying to sustain through discussions. I'll call them back-channel discussions. Um, they're behind closed doors. We don't advertise them. We don't talk to the media. Um, but we do talk, I will say. <laughs> we do talk very much with our government. We, we work on behalf of the United States people and the United States government. And so we are in very close communication with, with our government. And um, uh, I'll finish it off by again saying I'm blessed. I'm fortunate to be working with an Oscale team of people who have been very at very senior levels in our uh, in our government, um, in international organizations like NATO and senior positions also in our militaries and have a, a, a deep understanding of how essential it is to prevent crises rather than allowing them to erupt and then trying to deal with them. Because once a crisis takes over, the time scales are so short and mistakes are so consequential that um, the, the results are very, very unpredictable. Raymond, for the last part of our talk, now that we've gone right up to the present, I'd like to ask one retrospective question, then we'll end looking to the future. So looking back over the course of your career, it's remarkably eclectic, both within and beyond science. So really, maybe this is as much a generational question as anything else. To what extent for graduate students today looking to chart their future careers, is the path that you pursued advisable? Does it make sense nowadays to do what you were able to do in the 1970s at the dawn of not one, not two, but maybe three brand new fields? So I feel very lucky, and I, I think one, one, one should recognize that no matter how hard one works, um, luck always plays some role. You know, there are people who are smarter than me, more capable than me, work harder than me, better than me in any and every way, uh, and in one case or another may not have been lucky. In some cases, not lucky to live long enough and not lucky to have good enough health. There are all sorts of reasons, um, or maybe their family circumstances. Anyway, it's just a, first of all, a matter of recognizing, appreciating, and leveraging one's very good fortunes. Um, I actually, uh, uh, if anyone ha is interested at this interface between science and policy, or in general, in cross-disciplinary kinds of interactions, I described that also in the Miller Institute, cross-disciplinary, cross-science, in the end, my best advice to people, I don't say you have to do it this way, but this has been my experience and the best approach that I've seen is first and foremost, you have to have depth in at least one thing. You know, uh, so I'm not a big fan. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it overstated, but just to give the, make the point, I'm not a big fan of cross-disciplinary education at an early stage, like cross-disciplinary undergraduate degrees. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I totally encourage a 
college student or a graduate student or postdoc to uh, develop their broader interests. But the point is, it's really essential for them to have deep expertise in at least one thing so they can bring something to the table as they're starting to work across disciplines with other people. I've found too many people who, you know, uh, have very broad interests and they blossom in the cross-disciplinary way early on, but never create enough depth to make their contributions as worthwhile to others. So that's a trade-off we all have to make. We take risks. Um, I, I will say in the policy arena, it's very different from academia and specifically science. What I do, you know, I, I know what it takes um, with some reasonable assurance to have it be appreciated. I can be proud of some body of work, and even if it doesn't get broad um, notice or you know some big recognition and all that, I can feel very proud of it. I know, okay, I did something very special. I'll contrast that with the policy arena. That as soon as you start working with, let, let alone becoming a policymaker, especially if you have to be elected, um, I, I hearken back to the Roman expression: "You live by the sword, and you die by the sword." Um, those who go into policy um, very quickly realize that your whole career, everything you're working on, what, what you might have been working on the last 10 years can be upended at yeah. the moment's notice. An election can go a certain way, a policymaker can retire or disappear. For reasons that have nothing to do with the quality of your work or what you've done, you can really lose out. So I feel very lucky. And you know, maybe this explains why I've stood more on the academic end. I'd rather be the advisor to help happy to help it in whatever way it can. But I also respect those people who have gotten in the fray, they're either elected or appointed to high office and try to make a difference, but knowing that what they've done could be overturned right away. I work with a person, I actually work with two people who were uh, the lead negotiators for two major um, arms control treaties. Um, both of those treaties may disappear as a result of recent events. So you can almost say their life's work can yeah. be up. It's got nothing to do with them. In fact, it's almost worse. It's because of the quality of the work that they did. And by the way, the collaboration that they generated on both sides, that now current political cycles are such that that is all being rejected by certain entities. And I, again, want to be a little bit careful. I'm not trying to point fingers exclusively at the Russian Federation or China. We're seeing tendencies and abilities within the United States to also upend Absolutely. a lot of the longstanding approaches that we've used. So this is part of the human condition. You ask me, how can I be optimistic? And and my, my answer is because we recognize there's cyclicity and we have to be there to try and support the things that are now being perhaps undervalued or put down uh, by some people coming into power. And we're, we're going to keep on saying, no, this is really, this is a very valuable contribution. And we can only hope that there will be a future generation that can say, hey, you know, I heard you and I'm, I'm in, impacted by that comment and by the contribution that you or your generation made. And we're going to pick it up and run with it in the future. That's the best I can hope for. Finally, Raymond, last question, looking to the future, extrapolating from all that you've accomplished, what's the frontier for you for however long you want to remain active? What haven't you done that you want to? Uh, so I'm just starting a year of sabbatical, uh, which I'll do in place partly to, I'm going through my old notes, I'm trying to um, work on some analyses, uh, so technical uh, scientific analyses that have been put on the back burner because, you know, one deadline or another was was too much. Uh, to, uh, and and uh, so I'm trying to catch up on science. I have some big research collaborations. I've, I've got, I should start off by saying I also have some graduate students and people that I want to be able to pay a bit more attention to. We've got some really fantastic uh, experiments that we're planning to do over the coming year uh, in my lab or associated with my lab. And then also I have a big collaboration, a big team that I'm associated with, um, international team trying to do experiments um, at the National Ignition Facility uh, at Livermore. So that's more like big science where, you know, many dozens of people are involved with, with those efforts. And then finally, um, I do hope to be able to um, document a little bit more completely some of the um, policy related uh, material. I've been giving, so I've, I've been asked to give some talks and I'm being increasingly asked to give some lectures in these areas of national security, international security. And so I'm trying to develop some some of those lectures uh, a little more extensively. If I'm really lucky, I'll be able to write some of this up, either as articles or otherwise. But uh, I, I think there are a lot of opportunities there. 
Um, so you have plenty to do on the science end, including big collaborations, international collaborations. We're continuing with our outreach to um, counterparts in international security around the world. That's an ongoing effort. And then I'm also trying to see if I can't capture some of these uh, policy related activities and a set of lectures and writings that might be useful to others. Lots to keep you busy, no doubt. <laughs> Raymond, this has been a terrific and wide-ranging conversation. I want to thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it.